Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Patricia Dunn. Patricia's new novel is Last Stop on the Six. Patricia, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, Last Stop on the Six, how would you describe the novel? I'm trying to think of like, a, well, people have called it hilarious and heartwarming, but it's basically about a story of a woman who uh, leaves home after thinking she caused an accident that uh, paralyzed her brother. And she leaves and goes to LA and basically becomes an activist. That's the backstory. And then she's called home for her brother's wedding, which she has to face him and his family after 10 years being away. And it's all this mayhem. And it's an Italian American family in Pelham Bay, the Bronx, which is the last stop on the six, unless you live in Pelham Bay, then it's the first stop. So it's really, I guess the overall theme is it's really, if you, if you know, chaotic families that are really loud, but there's lots of secrets and things they don't say. And you, can you go home is always that question. Well, you can, but you really have to manage expectations or because what you think home was or what's going to be may not be what it was and definitely not what it is. So it's kind of like she couldn't save her brother. She thinks she's got to try to save him now because when she, oh, when she gets home to face him, he's also gone and nobody seems to know or will admit where he is. So he's kind of taken off. So she tries to find him in this book and also figure out her place in this family that she's that's bigger than like well life itself so and it's autobiographical to some sense people ask so is this based on your real story and it's like uh when i first started it was very based on my family and as time went on um and i put it in a virtual drawer because it's this i started this 25 years ago and i put it away and then was encouraged by a, a writer friend jim and han who actually knew about the book and loved it and said go back to it and I think after all the years of teaching the novel and writing my first book and that, that, well, writing the book that first got published, I kind of could look at it and say, wow, now I know how I think I can make this work. And that was fictionalizing a lot more than I had originally. And, so, and that I was mean, not an elevator pitch, but anyway. No, that, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well um, you know, novels aren't always easily uh, digestible in terms of an elevator pitch, but uh, yeah. that's fine. I'm curious, um, given that, you know, you said you, originally started working on it 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the original idea or impetus that led yeah. you to writing The Last Stop on the Six? Well, the original uh, was short stories. I was in my first uh, workshop at uh, an MFA program, uh, my early 30s, and I started work writing about these uh, girls called the Banana Girls, and from basically about girls from this neighborhood I grew up. But they were fictionalized stories, but based on stories I knew. Um, and was working on short stories. And then the following year uh, of my MFA program, I really wanted to take a class with this um, writer who I loved. Um, her name was Lindsay Abrams. And I got in. I was so excited. And then I got a call that said, uh, are you working on a novel? Because she's focusing this class on a novel. So no stories. And I said, yeah, I'm working on a novel. And uh, <laughs> I hadn't even thought about turning anything into a novel. But then once I committed to starting it just went off but i also i think the that same summer i got very caught up in um i had an uncle that was kind of disappeared in our family um long story and somebody i was just i got very caught up in missing people in my in in my family and uh, and the idea of secrets and families and especially when you think you know everything and then you find out like what how did i not know about that and so it just started at, from that point and then i finished it several years later. Um, and I did get an agent, my first agent, and she said, I love the book, love your writing, but you know, Canada just declared it the death of the novel. And that was when memoir is really big. So you got a memoir in you? Cause I'm not, I can't really sell fiction right now. And I'm like, Oh, great. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, kept trying to get it out there. And then I eventually said, all right, put it in the drawer. Um, and I had started something else that eventually was my first book that got published. And then went back to this about four years ago and I don't know, probably cut a hundred pages, a lot of other storylines that, you know, when you're writing your first book, what people don't always, or what we don't believe is that we'll ever write another book often. Um, so we put everything in the kitchen sink in there thinking, okay, I got to tell everybody the entire story of my entire world or this world. And then you kind of through revision, 
you figure out, well, maybe I don't. And then you kind of figure out, well, what is it that I really want to get across? And, you know, all the answers are in that first draft. So I just had to become experienced enough to be able to figure out what the answers were, what that first draft was telling me it had to be. So, so I know it's cliche and you probably hear this a lot, but your characters, if you really get to know them, um, even if they are based on inspired by real people, they do become their own people. And if you just kind of like don't get in their way and you let them go, they will tell you what story they need to tell you. Like uh, the main plot that this book revolves around did not happen until or really work until I came back to it many, many years after I first started it, even after I finished the first five drafts. So can you tell me about your MFA program? What was that experience like for you? Um, I was, I was, I did my MFA at Sarah Lawrence college where I wound up then teaching and running the writing, um, program for adults for many years. And it was, it, I have to say it was, it was amazing. Um, I was not able to, um, I'd been doing journalism and, you know, I'd wanted to be a writer since I was a kid and, but I don't think I could call myself a writer. I don't think you need an MFA to call yourself a writer, um, but I did not have that confidence. And so that program not only gave me that, but what it really gave me, I had great mentors, but I also found what became a writing community. Um, Jim and Han, and um, I mean, I can mention all of these writers I'm still writing with. Some were from that program or related somehow to people that I met, and we're still writing up to 20 years together. So if you know, people ask me the question, what's the one thing that you tell any writer? And I would say, you do not have to, or aspiring writer, don't do it alone. Find yourself a writing support group. Yes, you want feedback on your work, but you want people that are going to give you feedback on your life and support to keep you going because it's a long haul. I mean, it's like them, you think they say, oh, it's like birthing a novel, it's like birthing a kid to write a novel. This took so long. I think it was like putting the kid through graduate school, maybe medical <laughs> school. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, that, I think it was great. And that's because I met people. What I learned at Sarah Lawrence and what I continue to do is, as somebody who tries to instruct is I help people to get out of their way. And I also don't always practice what I preach because we are our worst enemies at writers. But also it helps to learn what you do well because we all know what we don't do well most of the time. And what we do well, we kind of dismiss. But if you know what you do well, you can really build on that. And learning that um, and starting to believe that uh, really made a big difference in what I I guess just in my development as a writer in general, that helped a lot. It helps a lot as a teacher too, though. And teaching really made a big difference. I think I learned more about writing at novels by reading novels in progress and helping people write their novels. Um, because you can see things in other people's work that you can't always see in your own, of course, you know. Sure. Well, well your novel, The Last Stop on the Six, is set in 1993 before the Gulf mm -hmm. War. Why did you make that decision about the setting and time period? Well, when I, I did go to LA, um, not for the same reasons this, the character does, but um, I became a, a social justice activist. I, you know, I didn't go out there for the Hollywood dreams. I went out there for, I wasn't, you know, with friends. I didn't know really why I was going. I think I need, needed to leave New York, needed to leave home without knowing it. And then I was an activist. I was very much working hard at that time with the idea of, before, well, the time the novel takes place with the idea of believing that we could stop the first Iraq war from happening. And, uh, you know, we had tens of thousands of people that were protesting, um, but the news at the time was only covering the few people across the street, right, that were for the war. But I still believed up into that last minute that we were going to be able to stop this from happening. And we weren't. But um I think that was important to me. And it, somehow it tied into this family of um, thinking that you could save people or you could make a difference. And I'm not saying that you can't, but I think sometimes we don't take the time to think about, okay, well, can I, maybe I also have to think about how to save myself, you know, that put the oxygen mask on first. Um, and I also have this, you know, I think the world is filled with things that happen and uh, they're important to, figure out like, even if they're in the background, they're happening. And how does that affect the world that we're living in? Right. I mean, we haven't seen the COVID novels yet, but I know a lot of my writing students don't want to place their books because they don't even know how to touch that time, this time period, but eventually people will. And I think um, fiction is a really important way of like 
sharing history with the world. Um, although if somebody ever reads my books and say, tells me, oh, I learned so much, then I kind of feel like I failed because I don't want you to learn. Even if you, you know, you, I want you to kind of maybe learn, maybe you will learn, but I want you to kind of say, I felt so much, right? Uh, I think that's the difference maybe between like, if I was going to write a history book. So, so I guess it's historical in that sense, but it's just really like just placing it in a period that impacts this main character's life, right? So, and that was also very close to me too. So right before we're about to go to a war, she finds out her brother's getting married and she's got to go home for the first time in 10 years. And so she's tries, she's still trying to stop a war when her brother's disappeared, you know, he's gone when she gets there, she thinks he doesn't want to get married and she tries to like stop a wedding. So, you know, like it's kind of this cause and effect, but anyway. So, that was well, a very are long you writing another novel? <laughs> That's okay. Are you writing another novel now? I just finished a novel that my agent has just gone out with. So, fingers crossed, toes crossed. Yeah, publishing is a whole other part of this that we won't go into now. But um, uh, it's the working title is "How I Killed Your Mother," and um, it's a little bit autobiographical, only that there is another exterminator in it. And it is at the center of it is a father daughter relationship, but it's the father is a serial killer. Um, and it's told from his point of view and the daughter's point of view doesn't know her father's history um, clearly. And that's the novel that's out right now. And so um, what I hope I've done is I try to make him as sympathetic as you can. And this does come from my obsession with serial killers, of, of course. Um and mostly uh, the son of Sam, and you know, he was called the 45 uh, caliber killer. He killed uh, my friend's cousin around the corner from my house when I was 12. And then he turned out to be the postman for my aunt. And then um, my uh, current husband's aunt uncle gave him a, the puppy, not the puppy that, you know, later on became, so that's a whole other thing. But right. he did, they did give him a puppy when he was a kid and his parents said he couldn't keep it. Uh, for some reason. And so there's all these connections and then, you know, and, but we didn't, you know, they didn't interview serial killers. We didn't understand why. And as I started just, you know, over the years, you know, people, I'm fascinated with the podcast and the interest. And it's because we're trying to make sense of what doesn't always have answers. And so I, my favorite character in maybe of all time, well, I wouldn't say of all time, but I, is Hannibal Lecter because you actually are, he's, you're able to sympathize with this person that does these horrible things. And I took that on as a challenge with this father character. Um, so whether I succeeded, hopefully I did, but that's what the new book's about. And hopefully it's still humorous. I mean, it's funny because I mean, I tell people about what my stories are about. They sound so like gruesome and bleak, but they got a lot of humor in it because that's just the, what comes out. I don't know if I can try with that, but anyway, it's funny. Yeah. How I killed your mother. It's funny. Uh, but anyway, um, but, that sound, it sounds yeah. interesting. Well, yeah. well, I know that you've taught writing and I'm sure that you can well, spend am, yeah. a lot of time, but what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Well, I think first I'd say is really believe that your stories matter now more than ever. Um, I mean, it sounds like something people say, but you have to tell your own story and you can tell it. People think that you are born with this talent or this thing to write. No, writing, you, the more you do it, the better you get, you, you know, and you can just figure out how you need to tell it, but it's hard to do alone and you don't need to do it alone. I mean, even the Hemingways and all of them, they had their community. So find yourself a community, whether you do it through a class or go to the library. Most libraries will have writing groups or you just put an ad online or you just do something, but you find writers that you can meet with. And now with online, you know, you can meet people all over the world, but that will not only give you feedback on your work, but help you when you get that rejection and you're like, I'm never writing again. And they'll say, I understand. Then don't worry. You don't have to write again. And then two days later, they're like, you know, kicking out of bed and saying, okay, what are you going to work on now? You know, cause you need that support. It's a long haul. And and it, there's a lot of joy in writing, but writing does not happen in that first draft, right? I mean, I'm writing the writing happens, but you got to, it's, it's, it's not going to be clean. People want, you don't worry about it being perfect. I mean, you know, Anne Lamont who's a, has a great book on writing, but she talks about shitty first drafts. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word, sorry. But your draft, first draft has to be messy. So in order for you to like make it really great, you have to have the paper film and the, what will get in your way is your own head. 
So I do a lot of timing. I just 10 minutes a day and you will have a novel written. I can't tell you how many people I have worked with that I've just made right 10 minutes a day and they get their books done, but you have to time it and promise yourself that you will not stop moving that hand or your fingers. And then you don't read back until you get to a point where you feel like, okay, I've gotten to an end. And then you can go back and do all the revision, but people keep stopping themselves. I mean, I think we do this because we're trying to sometimes figure out the story we're writing, but often we'll spend years on our first like 50 pages and they're going to be cut anyway. (laughs) So, because when we get to the end, we realize, all right, that's not the right beginning. So find other people, you know, you hear trust your instincts and I think people should in most cases, but writers, no, don't trust your instincts. Find people you can trust because your best stuff you will throw in the garbage. Like they say, Stephen King did with Carrie. And unless you have somebody like he he did his wife, I should learn her name. I'm always saying the wife. Um, Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Tabitha King pulled it out of the garbage. You probably, you know, the story and sent it in and that actually launched his career. Right. So you need people that will help you with that because often what you think is wonderful, like they say, your darlings and they may, it may, but it is the stuff you got to cut because it could could be beautifully written, but it doesn't work with the story you're writing. So find people that really though, aren't trying to write the story for you or just trying to give you feedback that's going to just, that doesn't, but they get you as a writer and they want you to write your story and your stories have to be told because if we're not going to tell our stories, who is right. So, um, you know, my, my family that I write about is a working class family and, um, I'm the writer in the family, but you know, everybody in my family can write if they just believe they could, they just, that's not what they choose to do, but I'm glad that I can actually that, get, that I got the support enough to do this, but I, it took me years and years and even an MFA before I can have the confidence. So, and then when I finally found a group of writers, they kind of helped boost you up because you could be writing for years. You have 20 novels and you're always done and you're going to still have that, those moments of doubts where you just don't believe in yourself. I mean, it's part of the artist like dilemma, right? We're all a little kooky and, uh, you know, like we're, we feel like, yes, we're great and we're awful, we're great. You know, it's all like I guess maybe a little bit narcissistic. But anyway, but stories really have to be told and we're, who's going to tell them if it's not us? Otherwise, you know, somebody else is going to try to tell your story and that's not your story. So, but anybody can write if they want to write. And if you can't, if you have no other choice, then you should do it, you know, and you can get help to do it. I think, you know, you don't have to love it, but if you have no choice, do it. So that was a lot of advice, but basically, <laughs> it's basically get support to do it. And if you, and I, w- I will add though, I used to tell people all the time, it was Grace Paley, it was a great short story writer. And she would, uh, I had the honor of hearing her talk a few times and she would tell people it's really hard to write, um, you know, to get the story that you want to tell it's the way you really want to tell it or as close as you can. So if you don't love it, do something else. And I would say at the beginning of my first class, I would always tell this to my class. If you don't love this, leave now. We'll give you your money back. And I was lucky because I probably would have gotten in trouble with the school if anybody ever did ask for a refund for that reason. (laughs) And nobody did. But after teaching for a couple of years, a student came to me and um, said, you know, and these are adult students, so they have a lot of careers, you know, lawyers, doctors. I mean, they're doing a lot of other things. So they really have to be, they're really committed to this. And this woman said, I don't love it a lot of the times, but I have no other choice. And I realized, wow, that's more of the truth, at least for me. So if there's something that gives you no other choice or it's like in your head that you want to write, but you know, you're know you thinking about it a lot, then do it. Because if you have a choice and there are other things you're going to make you more happier, or, then, then don't do it. But, sure. if it's, yeah. but if, you have, if you don't have that choice and you don't have to do it alone, um, and I will tell people too, and you I'm sure know this, um, we spend so much energy not writing, like more energy. If we put all the energy that we put into telling ourselves we can't write or why we can't write, or we wish we had the time to write, because you're never going to find the time. There's always, life will always take over. But if we put energy just into writing, even this, that 10, 15 minutes a day that we say we don't have, because there are real reasons why we think we, I mean, it's not like, but life will keep going. But if we put that energy there, you'd be able to write all the stories you need to write. But and I am saying this as somebody that does not always and often take her own advice. So it's easy for me to sit in a chair and say this, but sure. it took me 20 something years to get this book out in the world. So anyway. Hi, this is Jeff, the host of the Reading and Writing Podcast. 
I wanted to tell you about an app that can change how you plan parties and celebrations at your home. Drizzly. Drizzly is the most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep in under 60 minutes. Are you hosting a book club party and you need a couple of bottles of wine? Well, keep in mind Drizzly. Or do you and your friends make cocktails based on your favorite book characters or novels? If so, again, use Drizzly. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Drizzly is the number one app for alcohol delivery. Again, that's Drizzly, D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And right now, if you act, Drizzly is giving every new customer $5 off their first order. Just use the promo code FAST5 at checkout. Hey, this is Jeff, the host of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. I have a company that I want to tell you about that I think you will definitely be interested in as a podcast listener, Family Sounds. Have you ever gone to a family reunion and traded stories and laughed with your relatives? And later you thought, gosh, I wish there was some way that we had a way to preserve those stories and preserve those memories um, when we're not face to face. Well, now you do with Family Sounds. Family Sounds can create an hour-long podcast that's just for you, that's just for your family, that tells the stories of your family and your relatives. And Family Sounds team, they're pros. They've done this before. They have lots of experience crafting stories for public broadcasting through radio and podcasts. They will use your family's voices as well as a professional narrator to tie the story together. Again, the name of the company is Family Sounds, and you can find them at family-sounds.com forward slash books. Again, that is family-sounds.com forward slash books. Family Sounds, your memories, your family in a podcast today. So check them out, family-sounds.com forward slash books. Thanks for listening. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Either either that were published recently or even, you know, um, older novels. Well, it's funny. I just had to do something for um, Lit Hub where they wanted to know novels that had family secrets because I do love books that they're about like, families and that are complicated and that are messy. And um, uh, one uh, author, Jim and Han, uh, she has another book that will be coming out, but she wrote a book called The Small Revolution. And also the backdrop to, um, you know, uh, the uh, revolution, the, the the student uprising that happened in 1985 in Korea, but it's happens in the States. And, you know, and the, why I love it very much is that this main character makes a lot of not such great decisions because of really the secrets in her own family. Um, and, and then, so that, but what's really great is how that novel is also structured. It's like written in um, almost like paragraphs, paragraphs are numbered, right? So there's almost these vignettes that puts these stories together and it's, it's, you know, people would say experimental, but it works so well. And, um, and it's so packed with so, so much information that I think that that struct the way it's put together really makes a huge difference in how you can kind of feel that story. Um, as a writer, Barbara Jocelyn, um, she has a series of books and she has another one coming out, which I can't wait. Um, and they all take place um, in the same small town um, and they're different characters from these small towns but they're kind of where i go for my like uh i guess they're kind of like my feel good make comfort novel you know it's also about family and family secrets and um how like the lily garden was the one that i last read the ones she has now is the cranberry inn but they're all in the same town and i don't you know i grew up in the bronx pelham bay and it was like a small town everybody knew mm-hmm. business and but I never really had, I thought, an interest in reading about small towns, but there's something about her characters who go back to the small town 
or um, and this world that she builds that are very, very, um, I don't know. It's just, you love being there and you're also, and you care about these people and you kind of wake up in the middle of the night and you kind of think you know them, you know? It's like, you kind of think, oh, I should put their birthday in my um, phone to be, and you're like, no, <laughs> they don't really live. Um, uh, some tr- uh, Well, I'm also a huge, huge fan of um, you know, 100 Years of Solitude is probably one of my favorite books of ever time and if uh, you know it's one of those books like i can't even tell you what is 100 years is all dude about but it's like you just are, there's so much in there and there's so many like it just it just takes you on a ride like when i read i want to be take, you know taken on a ride like i don't want to feel like i put like the i don't want to anything that makes me feel like i gotta put the book down like the kite runner was a book that i remember i read like in one night which i rarely do because of just you know my own attention span but it's just one of those books I couldn't put down. Like I want a book that just like has me like sad at the end because I don't want it to end, but that I can't wait to get there. So yeah, there's so many great books out there um, that uh, let's see my sister, the serial killer, you know, but what I love about that book is uh, that it's also got so much humor in it. So I like books that also give you th- th- that a lot of unexpected happens. I mean, I think that's the thing that the hundred years of solitude, it's not a big secret because it's, been out so long but you got a main character that you think is a main character and like 10 page seven pages in whatever they're shot they're killed and you're like what um (laughs) but it works you know so um and i also have to i will confess that these days i watch a lot of uh great television um you know and i know a lot of playwrights that are writing for tv so it's probably why it's so great and um a lot of bad sitcoms you know sitcoms like are kind of my um my you know addiction it kind of makes me it's like what I do to kind of, you know, de-stress. Uh, sure. you know. So, although the news does seem more like unbelievable than some of the fiction that's, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. We, when you live in a world that is so um, like unbelievable, we go to read so that even if things are, you know, take place like on another planet, there's some sense to the, there's rhyme to the reason, you know, like reasons to rhyme, rhyme to the reason, right? Whatever. I mean, it, there's some sense made out of it. And even though wor- the world doesn't always work like that. So I think there's something comforting in like even reading about serial killers because, you know, there's something that makes sense to that. And I can't say that a lot of stuff is always making sense these days at all. And, um, and to try to figure it out. Well, I think that's why we write. Some people say we write to find the uh, questions that we answer to the questions um, I think I just write because um, I don't know if I have a choice, but then uh, voices will come out and the stories are told. And then I realize, okay, you're writing this story because you had to write it, but you didn't know it. And I guess I'm just right because it also helps me make sense of my world and it helps me say things. I mean, even as a little kid, you know, we are a loud family, everybody's competing to be heard. My parents, you know, you know, I had to work a lot of hours. A lot was going on all the time. But when I needed to be heard, I would write a note. And if I stuck it under their door, they paid attention. So there's power in that written word. So um, I think I really respect anybody who's writing and and just gets their work out there. And anyway, so let's see. I'm trying to think of. I, I could go on and on. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, so um, well, where can people <laughs> find you online if they'd like to learn more about you yes. and so, your novels? Uh, so you can find me at Patricia Dunn author dot com. That's my website, Patricia Dunn author dot com. And at Patricia Dunn author, that's my Facebook and Instagram. And uh if, for those of you on Twitter, uh, she writes at she writes. Um, but basically Patricia Dunn author dot com will give you all of, you know, more than you probably want to know about me, but it'll tell you about my books, my teaching you know, for, and all the stuff I'm trying to like tell you to come to and sell you and all that. That's the hard thing. You always got to promote, you know, you're promoting your work and you're like, I can, I'm very good at promoting everybody else. But when it comes to your own stuff, you're like, I don't want to talk about my own stuff. Can I talk about somebody else? Uh, you know, but we're all like that usually. Um, but my website will like at least give people a start. And I have an email if anybody, I also have a newsletter that's called why, uh, how not to write, which basically, I just give people a lot of advice on how not to write. Um, you know, it's a little twist there because then I just I give you some writing things. But I also share people's stories and what they do to avoid writing. Um, I remember I spent a month this summer microwaving dirt because I, I got into gardening and plants 
And there was all these gnats. And so somebody said, oh, if you microwave the dirt first. So I was, you know, microwaving like tons of dirt. And people thought I was insane. <laughs> but it's kept me from writing. Um, so, I, but then after a while, if you do things that are kooky enough, you figure maybe I should just sit down and write. But people share their stories. And, you know, so, but all that, you could find my newsletter and all that stuff through my Patricia Dunn author. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Patricia Dunn, author of the new novel, the last stop on the six, the novel is available now. So go buy a copy and Patricia, thanks for doing this interview. No, oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Last stop on the sixth, a novel by Patricia Dunn. Chapter 11. The whole bus ride home, I rubbed St. Anthony's bald spot in my pocket. I don't know if I believed for a second he would help me find Jimmy. And I didn't believe Archangel Michael would stop this war. But both chunks of plastic gave me hope. False hope was better than no hope. The Don C. and Son van was parked in front of the apartment. I expected to find Dad home, but no one was there. I figured he was in his office, which was the section of the basement that Sal, the landlord, hadn't converted to an illegal studio or used to store his hundreds of jars of tomatoes and bottles of homemade wine. It was also not where Antoinette, the wife, hid to smoke her Virginia Slims the cigarette with the slogan, You've Come a Long Way, Baby. The longest Antoinette had come was from a small town outside of Naples, Italy. She spat the word feminist with the same enthusiasm she used when she spat fascist. I had thought the wife title was some old-school misogynist custom, but now I wondered if it was old-school street smarts. She knew her husband was up to shady shit. We all did. The illegal basement studio was only the foam at the top of the blended tomato jar. In exchange for spraying our building and the three other Sal owned, Dad was permitted to store his chemicals and other exterminating paraphernalia on the shelves with the jarred tomatoes and homemade wine, which I was sure Dad helped himself to on occasion. Dad never ratted out Antoinette for her smoking, and she apparently never told Sal where the bottles of missing wine went. The door to the office was open, so I walked inside. Sitting at the makeshift desk, a card table that Sal let Dad use until he needed it for jarring season in August, was Billy, talking on the blue rotary phone and flipping through a Rolodex. I peeked over his shoulder at the wall calendar to see if there was any mention of Jimmy, any clue as to where he had gone. But other than the tux appointment that Carmela had told me about and the wedding, The only things on the calendar were stops, when, where, and a note indicating whether a side or back entrance had to be used. Restaurant owners were especially uptight about an exterminator walking through the front door with a tank in hand. It's still there, Billy said to me, without looking up. Right on the shelf between a bottle of wine and a plastic container of pesticide was the empty glass jar we had used so many years ago to catch the moth we had thought was holy. Billy hung up the phone and swung around. What's up? I went to Carmela's. Shit, he smacked his forehead. She's going to kill me. I was supposed to pick up my tux and have her check the fit today. Fat Freddy showed up. Billy looked at me. You okay? Billy was the only one I had ever told about that day in the alley. I made him cross his heart and swear to die if he told anyone, even Jimmy. I understood now that what happened wasn't my fault, and my training as a rape intervention advocate taught me how victims blame themselves, which was why so many rapes and sexual assaults went unreported. I had blamed myself, and maybe I still did. I knew Fat Freddy was an asshole, and still I followed him into the alley. You okay, he repeated. I nodded, but we both knew I wasn't. What did the fat fuck want? Jimmy. Oh, Billy swung back to the Rolodex. He said Jimmy better show before it was too late. Does Jimmy owe him money? Is Jimmy in trouble? Is that why he ran away? I swung Billy's chair around to me and knelt in front of him. Please talk to me. Billy stood, pulled me to my feet and hugged me. If I weren't shaking so hard and afraid that if he let go, I would crack into a trillion tiny pieces, 
I would have pushed him off and demanded he tell me what kind of trouble Jimmy was in. Don't worry. Jimmy knows what he's doing. Trust me. He whispered in my ear, and to the rhythm of the steam radiator, Billy held on to me, swaying side to side, until he knew I could stand on my own. When he stepped back, he took one of the metal tanks from the shelf, and to test the hose, he sprayed into a corner. The smell of a skunk farting rotting eggs brought back memories of the days Dad and I exterminated together. When we were working stops, it was about the job, killing roaches, setting mouse or rat traps. It was about us. Billy slipped into the gray overalls with Don C. and Son embroidered in red on the back. Exterminating had too many letters to fit. Besides, it also cost $5 a letter. I insisted he let me help him lift the green camping-sized pack with the filled tank over his shoulders and onto his back. Who are you going to call, I asked. I ain't afraid of no ghost, he smiled. But it was clear he was working hard at it. Catch you later. I pulled his strap. Let me come. I got this, he said. I know you do, but it'll be fun. L.A. has warped your idea of a good time. I smiled, and I was sure he could see I was working hard at it, too. You can tell me you don't want to be alone. It's okay. Thanks, I said. But for the first time in all the years that Billy, Jimmy, and I had been friends, nothing felt okay between us. Not the way it had been when we hid in the basement so Dad wouldn't find Jimmy and force him to go on another audition or when we played stickball on the street until one of the Spaldines hit a beach chair lady in the leg, or hung out in the park drinking and laughing our asses off. We were inseparable. We finished each other's sentences. We started each other's sentences, too. Conjoined at the soul, the beach chair ladies would say, only it sounded better in Italian. The van was gone. Fuck, I can't believe it, Billy said. You think it was stolen? Fuck, 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 he shouted. Watch the mouth, Mrs. Bellini called down from the window. Billy waved her an apology. I held back from giving her the finger. Everyone always cussed, but it was only Billy, Jimmy, and I who were called out for it, the Americans and their wayward friend. Excuse me, Mrs. Bellini, I called up to her. Is that Miss Hollywood? It's me, Angela. You got so skinny. This was both an insult and a compliment. How are you? If I didn't ask, it would have been written on my gravestone, Here Lies Teresa Angela Campanozzi. On that faithful day, she didn't ask Mrs. Bellini how she was. May her soul burn for all eternity. My bunions are Florida grapefruits. Sorry to hear that. What can you do? Did you see the van? Your father drove off ten minutes, maybe. Thank you, I shouted. See, Billy, it's okay. Billy took hold of my shoulders. It's anything but okay. What are you talking about? Not near the elephant's ears, he mouthed to me. Billy waved goodbye to Mrs. Bellini, and I followed him in silence, the seven blocks to the train.